don't be afraid to spend the money. But think about how it's going to benefit you. What does it do? Not only first and foremost in your your cash flow. How does it improve cash flow? But also when you go to exit that property, uh, what does it do uh, for the bottom line in terms of NOI and cap rate and value? And that's the real way to look at it. Hello, everybody. This is Jake Sensiano, host of the Wheelbarrow Profits Podcast, here with my co-host, the multifamily mentor, the coach, chef, the father of six, the best-selling author, the G-Daddy, Gino Barber. Gino, how's it going? Mr. Stenziano, I'm doing good, bro. How are you? Doing great. You got any, you got any updates for us today, Gino? It's 85 degrees outside. It's still summer down here. Um, it's awesome. I mean- Multifamily investor turned weatherman. He's doing it today, folks. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know what? When that's the biggest problem you have, I think that's that you're having a good week when you're worried about the weather, right? Other than that, I mean, we're signing up students. Um, deals are harder to come by, but you know what? Just keep underwriting and they will fall in your lap. As like a lot of our students say, if you're out there, you're, you're looking for deals, you're looking at deals. My brother was out in Pittsburgh yesterday and they were talking to the mailman. Okay. Talking about the routes. You know what? You go to the, go to the post office, go to the police department, find out where the areas are that you don't want to be in and find out where the areas are that you want to be in. I thought that was a great tidbit. I mean, I saw a picture of my brother with the postman. I was like, dude, out there making it happen. So that's the only way you're going to find deals in this market. Just get out there and start networking like crazy. Underwrite those deals, baby. Well, we have a very special guest today. Today's guest is Steve Burgess. Steve is the founder and CEO of Summer Breeze USA RV Resorts and has been a successful real estate investor for more than three decades. He's logged over $320 million in combined personal and client transactions, buying and selling everything wow. from land development, residential construction, single family rentals, apartment buildings, and most recently, RV parks. Excited to find out a little bit about these RV parks. So without further ado, Steve, welcome to the show. Hey, good morning, guys. Thanks for having me. All right, so my first question is a selfish one, but I wanna, I wanna hear a little bit about the transition from apartments into RVs and, and the why behind that. Sure, well, we are in the, uh, the Houston, Texas area. And in the Houston space, uh, multifamily, especially the value add, the class C, C plus, B minus, which is the stuff that I like to do, is harder and harder to come by. So uh, I guess unless you have connections or relationships with your mailman, who can, <laughs> like you guys apparently do. Boots on the ground, you know, we're doing it. <laughs> yeah, so um, I, I'm not as, I'm not on as good of terms with my mailman, but anyways, aside from that, uh, the multifamily space is very, very competitive in Houston, Texas. We have buyers coming from a uh, variety of sources. You guys are probably familiar with some of the, uh, the larger uh, multifamily um, investment groups that uh, bring new investors in uh, without promoting them, but uh, bringing new investors in to help find and syndicate deals. So that's part of the, con uh, the uh, competition, but also uh, local buyers. And then you have buyers who are coming in from the Northeast and then also the West uh, and out of Asia. So uh, for example, in California, I'm looking at something that just popped up on my screen. Some of the value add opportunities are advertised at 100% occupancy but uh, a 2% cap rate. So I don't know about you, but 2% cap rate, I'm not interested. I'd love to sell at a two cap, uh, but I'm not a buyer at a two cap. There's no meat left on the bones. So my last deal in Houston was, um, we sold a property in May of 2017. It was a 109 unit apartment deal on the east side of Houston. A value add, uh, bought in at a, at a pretty competitive price, we were able to sell and make considerable money on that deal. Our holding period was 23 months. Uh, so just, it's the classic value add. You go in, you spend a bunch of money on capital improvements, upgrade the asset, increase the rents, uh, improve your NOI, and of course, um, value is a uh, function of your NOI and you appropriately apply the cap rate. Uh, so during that process, I was looking for the next deal I knew um, that within one to two years, we'd have that property sold. And as I said, our holding period was 23 months, a nice rate of return on that property. But I was looking for the next opportunity. And um, 
also on the east side of Baytown. I think this one was a 60 unit deal. I had spent quite a bit of time driving over to that side of town. Met with the broker uh, probably three different times. And uh, the very day that I submitted uh, an offer to put the property under contract, it felt good about the terms of the buy price and everything. Uh, the broker informed me, hey Steve, we got a cash offer over the weekend. Sorry, he's in, you're out. Um, and it took quite a while just to even identify, as you guys know, you probably have to look at, you know, 10 or 20 or 30 deals. Easily uh, that hurts. Find maybe one or two that are worth driving to. So in Houston, Houston, pretty big city. Um, but you do all your research out of your office and then you find something that looks like it may have potential and jump in a car and do your drive by and then maybe make a schedule a meeting with a broker to walk the property. But you look at a lot of deals, turn over a lot of stones to find that one gem. So during that period, uh, I had been thinking about the RV space anyways. Uh, my family and I uh, have been RV years since about 2004. So the last 15 years or so, we've been RV years. And uh, prior to that, we were tent campers. So the oldest boys, um, and my youngest boy all went through Cub Scouts and then into Boy Scouts. My two older boys are both Eagle Scouts. My wife and I are very involved in the scouting program at the Cub level and at the Scout level. So spent a lot of time outdoors as a family, uh, really connecting with each other, forming those family bonds, and um, kind of got to the point to where uh, I think we did uh, spend a little too much time uh, in the tent. <laughs> I said, honey, no more. I'm not camping in a tent. And it was actually her idea to go and look at RVs. And I personally had never I mean, seen drive by on the road all the time. But I personally had never uh, been in one or stayed in one. So uh, we bought our first little used RV travel trailer. I think it was a 24 foot. Um, but, you know, lo and behold, the thing had an air conditioner. Unlike our tent, it actually had little restroom, it had a little shower, it had a kitchen. So kind of um, home away from home, being able to get all the comforts of home um, outside of uh, our, our house. So it for us, it, it changed the whole camping experience. Um, and then from there, you know, we eventually bought a large travel trailer and now we have a motor home. So really, uh, those experiences in years of spending time with family um, had really impacted my life. And so I began thinking about the RV concept here in the Houston area. But one of the things that I discovered, so um, we, we spent 14 years in Michigan and the Michigan climate, of course, is much different than Texas. So in Michigan, um, the, uh, the RV parks uh, cater to a different primary demographic. So for example, because of the cold weather, RV parks are typically closed six months out of the year, roughly April to September, October. And because of that, you don't really have the long-term guest, the monthly guests as we call them, uh, staying at those RV parks. You tend to have more of the family vacationer. So you might be able to stay two or three days or a week or two weeks. But the RV parks there typically offer uh, some kind of uh, family-friendly amenity, so things for the kids to do, and sometimes it's just really simple stuff. But when we got to Houston and began looking for RV parks to go and stay at, take the family to, what we observed was that most of the parks here, of course, they are open 12 months out of the year, but they cater more to the, uh, the long-term guests, the monthlies. And we have a lot of people, whether they're working on a pipeline, or plant expansion, petrochemicals, any number of things, uh, but they tend to be more the long-term guest as opposed to uh, the family demographic. So in my mind, there existed and still does a real void in the marketplace in Houston for that type of RV resort. And so that really is where the, uh, the concept of Summer Breeze USA RV Resorts was born. So it was really the culmination of my past experiences, spending 14 years in Michigan, bringing those experiences here to the Houston market and combining them with 
time spent in the, in the multifamily space. Uh, so feeling like I was getting squeezed out in multifamily and uh, they began to transition into RV. Steve, can I just get really clear on what you just said? I, I think what you do is you have a non-vacation RV rental. And I want to just be very clear so the listeners understand what's going on here because uh, you, you kind of just were very calm and you talked through it. And I just want to make sure that we're, we're fully understanding what, what you're doing here. Well, yeah. So there are, with any RV space, um, there are two or three primary demographics. So the one that the Houston market serves is, uh, is primarily the long-term monthly guest. And so when I say monthly guest, they um, are being charged a monthly rate as opposed to a daily rate or a weekly rate. They, they are there month to month. By the way, one of the advantages of being in the RV space is that you're not dealing with tenant lease law. So with uh, an apartment unit, if you want to get rid of a tenant, evict that individual, uh, it can be quite challenging, especially depending on the area that you're in. Some areas are easier than others. So in the RV space, uh, um, the laws and licensing is different. It, it's more like along the lines of uh, retail. So if someone is staying on your space and they're not authorized to, uh, it's like shoplifting and you can lease and have them removed and arrested immediately if they don't pay. So it's very different. You can have them um, ejected um, the same day. So that, that aspect of it is, is very different. Uh, another primary demographic, uh, there are really a, a couple of more, but one of them is the family vacationer. So typically from about March uh, in the Houston area, March to uh, into October through Halloween, have a lot of families who own RVs and they love to take the kids out and uh, go and explore. And once again, even uh, the amenities sometimes can be fairly simple. For example, just having um, a basketball court, whether it's indoor or outdoor, just a place for the kids to go and shoot baskets, a place for the kids to go and ride their bikes. Uh, you can do shuffleboard courts, you can have an activity center, you can have scheduled events like an Easter egg hunt. Halloween decorating contest that RVers love to participate in these deals. So that's another segment of the market that's largely underserved in the Houston area. Uh, I only know of in within the Houston MSA, there's only one other RV uh, park that, that caters to the demographic. And in the summertime, uh, you, you can't even get in unless you reserve the space several weeks in. They are sold out. So it's amazing. It's a phenomenal opportunity. One more segment of um, the RV space uh, that you can appeal to is uh, the, the seniors. So what the Texans. So you have people like I used to be in Michigan. They, they fly south for the winter and they typically show up. They begin arriving in around November and they'll stay through March or April, oftentimes. Uh, just before the tax deadline, so they want to get back and work uh, get the taxes done. So that's a third segment also that can help uh, strengthen the bottom line, your occupancy uh, in those winter months. Steve, it sounds like you said a few minutes ago that you have property rights. Uh, with, with, with respect to the RV space? Yes. <laughs> if people are stealing from you, you can rights. do something about it. <laughs> there you go. There you go. We like that. So Steve, where are you finding these opportunities? I, this sounds like this, the industry is fragmented, not like multifamily. It sounds like the self storage space 15 years ago, where there's a lot of mom and pops. Where are you finding these deals? Yeah. And that, that what you just mentioned is, is actually a huge, huge point. So there's a huge opportunity in the RV space. As you said, it is highly fragmented. So you have a lot of small individual owner operator, mom and pop type operations. And in my mind, therein lies the opportunity. There are less sophisticated operators. There are less sophisticated sellers. Um, they don't even know what, what cap rate means and NOI. You know, they, they keep their books. Sometimes um, some operators keep them better than others. But they, uh, they lack level of sophistication. And, and again, therein lies the opportunity to where you can come in 
and acquire some of these assets at very attractive prices and begin to consolidate operations to where now you're running more than one park or two or three or four and so on. Um, and there aren't many operators that are doing that. It's beginning to become more and more popular. So I think we're more of that, but we're really right on the front edge of that. Mm -hmm. So what I like to do, uh, we own four parks all together and two of them were existing parks. And so if we go back to my book, The Complete Guide to Buying and Selling Apartment Buildings, where I'm an advocate for the value add approach, and I talk at length about that uh, in the book, um, I, I am applying that same concept to um, existing parks. So I'll go in, look for an undervalued asset, and then go in and spend a bunch of money on capital improvements to upgrade the asset, uh, to, to add additional amenities, to increase the occupancy and increase the rates. Um, Steve, what are the top so, amenities that you're adding, just out of curiosity? Well, our property in Cairo, uh, we spent a little over a million dollars on that property. So um, one of the things we did was we upgraded the swimming pool. We completely redid it, but we also added uh, a very large hot tub. And in fact, on the website, it says we boast largest hot tub in Texas. Uh, and to my knowledge, that's true. Uh, however, in, in our newest project in the Katy area, we're building an even larger hot tub. And there's a reason behind that without getting into the detail, but, but uh, there's a very good reason for putting in uh, oversized hot tubs. And the primary reason is people love them. Um, but most business owners are thinking more about the expense side of the equation and they're not focused on the customer. Uh, for us, we're not afraid to spend the money. We would rather spend the money, improve the assets um, and the amenities. Uh, but some of the other things, uh, our Conroe Park, for example, uh, have any kind of playground equipment at all. It's a beautiful park. It's on 38 acres in National Forest. We have 110 sites. We have cabins. There are three ponds. We just put in a fourth pond. Um, but, but nothing really for the kids to do other than to ride their bikes around and kind of uh, there's some trails in the woods and everything that they can go through. But um, we put in um, a very large outdoor basketball court. We put in uh, a, a very uh, commercial grade playground system. We uh, added the hot tub, as I already mentioned, and I don't know if you're familiar with uh, a palapa structure, but a palapa is is uh, like um, an islander look. It's a roof covering with thatch, with palm leaves, and large bamboo posts. Key West. Yeah, there you go. So to give us a, give it that whole summer breeze, tropical look is what we're trying to achieve. Um, and they actually provide some very nice shade. Uh, our Conroe Park also. Um, so just, just like with apartments, you know, you have class A, B, C, and D, and, and you might think if you're not an RV or an experienced in the RV space, you might think that all RV parts have roads in them. When I say roads, I mean hard covered surfaces like either asphalt or concrete. Well, lo and behold, many of the older parts do not. They're gravel, some are even dirt, the sites are unlevel. So imagine trying to set your, your 30 foot RV trailer up on space, mom and dad are sitting with their, you know, their feet up and their head back and, and almost going to roll off the bed. Kids are rolling off the bunk beds. That's part of the fun of it. Racing, <laughs> things like that, believe it or not. Um, believe it or not, just having level RV sites is kind of a big deal in the space. So mm -hmm. it's just serving that those very, very basic needs and meeting those uh, on every level. But our Conroe Park is a I'd say when we bought it, um, uh, all the roads are gravel and uh, you know quite a bit of deferred maintenance, and potholes, and everything. Uh, in the month of July, toward the end of the month, we completed um, completely redoing the park. It's all now uh, brand new, uh, hard asphalt road surface road surfaces, and uh, of course our guests love it. We're seeing our occupancy rise. Uh, as a result of that, and we just raised rates. Uh, we didn't spend all this money over a million dollars in upgrades to not raise the rates. So trust me, somebody's going to pay for those, and it's our guest. 
Uh, but the beautiful thing about it is when you look at, um, and this is another concept that investors often don't understand, and the same holds true for apartments also, but if you spend, uh, let's just say 100,000 on a capital improvement on 100 spaces, and then you raise your rates by um, $25 per space times 100 is 25 times 12 is 30,000. So the $100,000 that you spent, uh, you say, okay, I'm gonna get uh, an extra $30,000 a year in revenue out of my 100,000. You know, okay, it's a 30% return. It sounds like a pretty good deal. However, when you go to sell the asset, that 30,000 flows to the bottom line, and that 30,000 in additional LI, even with a, a cap rate of 10 applied is now 300,000. So the 100,000 that you spent, now 300,000, and again, that's at a very uh, generous cap rate of only 10. So you use a seven cap or an eight cap, and of course that number just goes up. Mm -hmm. Just little things like that, that you have to understand, investors need to understand and be aware of, that um, don't be afraid to spend the money. Think about how it's gonna benefit you. What does it do, not only first and foremost in your, your cash flow, how does it improve cash flow, but also when you go to exit that property, uh, what does it do uh, for the bottom line in terms of NOI and cap rate and value? And that's the real way to look at it. So Jake, there's a few other things that you can put in, in RV parks. I have a friend who's building one in Ocala. They have a restaurant there. They have a county store there. They're building a big auditorium. So if you want to do weddings there or, or retreats there, um, like he said, bike routes, anywhere to monetize, you can have businesses within businesses. This is like multifaceted RVs, like multifaceted multifamily, where you have different revenue generators in there. So it's, it's an amazing business model. Steve, what I wanted to ask you is how is the manager of these parks? Is it easy to find a management company to manage these parks? Yes, uh, currently I have a general manager who oversees operations for all four parks. Um, she has not really had that much difficulty. Uh, just, just like any position that you're trying to fill, you're gonna post the opportunity and uh, call through the resumes. Um, and oftentimes you can take advantage of uh, lower wage costs by trading services for uh, employment, for mm -hmm. example, some of our winter Texans are seniors, but they're looking for something to do. They don't necessarily want to work full time, but maybe 20 or 30 hours a week. And so we uh, offer a little bit of compensation, but also with a discount on their lot. And uh, these are people who are, generally speaking, um, relaxed, uh, professional, you know, well-educated, seniors who are just looking for a little bit of a break on their RV sites. Mm -hmm. So um, you mentioned uh, some of the additional amenities. Our newest park in Katy that's currently under construction is on uh, 33 acres. It's right on Interstate 10. We've got great exposure to the interstate there. Uh, Katy, Texas is a booming area. Uh, it's exploding in growth straight out the I-10 corridor. Um, We'll have uh, phases one and two, 214 sites. That park is under construction right now. Uh, and we do have photos, and I think we've got some video with uh, drone footage of the park that's under construction. But um, that park will actually feature a really awesome water slide. Um, so again, we're thinking uh, family friendly, the kids come in. So we've got a huge pool that's uh, the I think they're called a zero entry, um, fairly large in size, and I, I guess it goes up to maybe 20 or 24 inches deep. But it's got the big tipping bucket and all the water slides and stuff that kids can climb up and down and slide around on. And then adjacent to that is a large swimming pool, and that's the one that has uh, the even larger hot tub that I was referring to that's being built as we speak. And uh, if your listeners want to Check us out. You can go to summerbreezeusa.com and uh, take a look at some of the, the photos online and the video and everything. But uh, it's pretty exciting. A lot of positive feedback. We've attended uh, the RV trade shows in Houston, uh, the NRG Center for the last uh, three years. And um, just getting a lot of excitement, a lot of positive feedback. And I, I'm 
confident that this park is going to be a home run for us. What are cap rates right now? Do you think in in the in the RV space, especially in Houston, where do you see them landing? Well, um, for a higher quality asset uh, that's you know, 95 percent occupied and stabilized, and you've got good historicals, uh, probably around seven. I've seen. Some larger portfolios trade even in the six and a half range, uh, so fairly attractive. Um, regionally, I think they can be even a little bit stronger than that, you know, mm -hmm. six and a half to six range. But generally, six and a half, seven, uh, less um, assets that aren't quite as high of a quality are probably going to be like in the seven and a half, eight range. Uh, so, you know, pretty good return for investors. So before you get to the short answers, I just want to add, want to ask you this question. If people want to get into a different space, we've been stuck in the multifamily lane forever. What did it take for you to get out of it? I mean, like your mindset, you were doing multifamilies and single families forever. What sparked that interest other than the multifamily drying up? Well, that was the primary thing, but also um, our family experience uh, for the last 14 years or 15 years since 2004, um, just knowing what we liked and what we looked for as a family. And my wife has been very much a part of this also um, in that when we travel, we're looking ahead online for the types of RV parks or resorts that we want to stay at. And, um, you know, she's a great source of feedback for me in that she's like, no, honey, uh, they don't even have roads in that park. That one looks kind of dumpy and that one doesn't look very clean. Um, that one doesn't have um, 50 amp service. They only have 30 amp service. Those are all little things that um, you should generally be aware of. So I guess I would say if I were new looking to get into the RV space and I didn't know anything at all about it, I would start by visiting some different RV parks and maybe staying there, whether they, whether you rent an RV yourself or a lot of the parks have um, cabins or what they refer to as park models. Uh, our parks have those as well. So uh, looking uh, to gain some experience that way and just spend some time uh, visiting different RV parks and seeing what they have. And you really need to stay there also you know, so that you have an understanding don't now know how to hook up uh, the 50 amp power to your motorhome or hook up your sewer line or the water hose. I mean, it's just all basic parts of, of RV camping. Mm -hmm. Very cool. All right, let's take a quick time out to hear from our sponsor. Gino, I know a lot of our listeners are wanting to take their multifamily investing business to the next level. I know that you've been hard at work helping Jake and Gino students do just that using our framework. Can you explain to the listeners how they can get our help? Guys, we've been hard at work growing our community of like-minded investors and the results of our members has been nothing short of incredible. We're looking to grow this amazing group. What we're looking for is those who wanna follow our proprietary framework that we've created. Buy right, manage right, and finance right. Leverage our connections, education, and mentorship as ways to take your business to the next level. So if you're interested in finding out more about how you can become a part of our amazing community, apply to work with us at jakeandgino.com forward slash apply. All right. And we are back. So just from the management side, you got, you, you really sparked my interest here. Um, the, the 200 unit, what does the, the, the structure look like that in terms of how many employees we have in the 200 unit and, and the roles and responsibilities? Well, generally one full-time park manager, um, depending on how busy the park is, if you've got a lot of guests coming in and out, it's, it's definitely helpful to have a second person working that front desk, especially on the weekends, Friday, Saturday, people checking in for the weekend and then checking out on Sunday morning, usually Sunday afternoon. Um, so there's one to one and a half, and then you uh, typically want to have um, a porter, someone who goes around and helps keep the grounds clean, picking up if you have cabins or park models, then those units need to be cleaned uh, afterwards. Not all, not all RV parks have cabins or park models. Some of them don't. So if you don't, that's not something that you're going to be concerned about. But uh, the, the rents on those are comparable to uh, hotels mm -hmm. and, in fact, in some cases, more. You know, the 125, 150, 200 a night, depending on the time of the season and everything else. 
so uh, it can be uh, very lucrative. Uh, and then also generally a full-time maintenance person. So little things pop up just like they do with apartments uh, every single day. Uh, with a 200 park, we could probably uh, afford you know, a, a second maintenance person and possibly a park manager, assistant manager, and then another part-time individual. Uh, it's also helpful to have, in this case, we'll have uh, a swimming pool and a water park, and probably have uh, staff out there in the summertime when it's really busy monitoring that. Um, so will it be a, a lifeguard or just someone monitoring the water slide? Really more of a, uh, just a, uh, somebody monitoring. You don't need to have necessarily uh, an actual lifeguard that's trained and certified lifeguard. Uh, you probably have seen at most of the hotels and um, similar type facilities where they have signs posted, warning, swim at your own risk, you know, the park not responsible for accidents or anything. Of course, you, you really are because you'll, you're not, you'll, you'll be sued like anybody else. <laughs> yep. Anyways, um, we're really not re required and probably won't have an actual certified lifeguard. I mean, that, that could change, but, you know, that's, the, that's probably $10 an hour or $12 an hour. You know, mm -hmm. Very so, affordable. So so a, a, self, a selfish personal question here. I got a, a hill in the back that goes right down to the lake, okay? And I've always considered about putting a water slide down there. So how much are you spending oh, yeah. on the water slide so I can get into it for myself here? <laughs> well, a water slide like that, I'd say probably go buy yourself a slip and slide. And <laughs> Jake's not on a slip and slide day. guy. No, Jake wants the real thing. No slip and slide for Jake. Yeah. <laughs> Well, the, the real McCoy, depending, uh, you can easily spend uh, one to two million. Uh, on the, park. Uh, the, uh, the water park equipment with the slides and everything else, uh, believe it or not, uh, the swimming pool component of that is more expensive than uh, the water park. Mm -hmm. So because of all the, uh, the commercial grade pumps, I think this water park is going to have a total of seven pumps. So you have to be prepared in the event that one or two of them fail, you have to have backups. And then the filtration system is insane. You know, it's many gallons per minute that have to be able to flow through. Uh, so it's, it's really uh, can be quite expensive. But again, I look at it as, okay, what's, what's the additional revenue that this is going to generate? Uh, and those numbers are huge. Um, and then what does that do to my NOI? And if you um, apply a cap rate of six or seven, whatever that number is, I use implied valuation tables to where I can look at the, a matrix of various um, uh, cap rates and uh, valuations across time. So usually like a five year time horizon, uh, I'm in my exit on these, but um, you look at the cost, what it does to value, and then um, make a decision from there. More importantly for me, what I'm looking for is um, I'm, we're spending money on these amenities. Um, the, the, the core underlying business here is, is RV rental space. So what I'm trying to do is drive my occupancy the higher I can get my occupancy, 95, 97, 99%, uh, that puts upward pressure on prices. And I want to drive rates up as high as the market will bear. And that, of course, um, those higher rates, you're allowed to achieve greater efficiencies. That, uh, that excess cash flows to the bottom line and translates, converts to, uh, to value through your, whatever the applied cap rate is. What's so the occupancy? Uh -huh. Sure, no doubt. What, what's the occupancy like in the off season and and the seasonality? How's that play? Because obviously you're driving this up, and you know something like a water slide is going to help occupancy. You know, probably year round because they're going to see it on the website and think, "Wow, these guys are very professional and whatnot." But you know, say January. What's what's the occupancy like typically in January? Well, so the neat thing about that is is that while the uh, summer family vacationers are transitioning out starting in around October, November. I mentioned the winter Texans who began to transition in, they're flying south to take advantage of the warmer climate. 
uh, beginning in about October, November, and all the way through April or so, which is about the time that you start to crank up uh, like Good Friday uh, to get the water facilities and family facilities open back up. So there really is an awesome with that seasonal component. Uh, and of course, you have to be able to appeal uh, to the winter Texans, to the seniors. Um, what is it about your park, your facility, that's going to attract them from all other parks? Um, and in our case, uh, some of the things that they like to do um, in the activity center, there's uh, games, scheduled games, and things like that. But a lot of our seniors, what we're finding is they love to hang out in the hot tub. Well, we happen to have the biggest hot tub in Texas, and it's a great place to hang out. Uh, and in the winter months, uh, the hot tub stays open, it's heated. And if it happens to be a little bit drizzly outside or a little bit cool, well, it's covered with a large palapa structure and it's lighted so they can hang out and enjoy themselves. And uh, we fill our hot tubs up with seniors. And like, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's things like that that keep them coming. And I say that, uh, you know, with respect to the, the hot tub, um, we've stayed at, at really nice resort before where the hot tub was a four person hot tub. And so, um, you know, just one quick example two of my boys went down to the pool, they were going to get in the hot tub. Well, there was a senior couple in the hot tub. Picture a uh, little old man, little old lady in the hot tub uh, that's big enough for four people. So you're practically knee to knee. And so my boys came back and said, Dad, there's some seniors in the hot tub. It's too crowded in there. There was only two people in there. So it's part of that. It's these life experiences that we've taken these things. And I uh, thought, you know, let's just blow this up and make it uh, a real amenity, a Texas mm -hmm. hot tub, as we refer to it. So anyways, it's kind of where that, that concept comes from. And it's been very successful for us. That's smart. Uh, so I'm sure you you had plenty of experience with Fannie, Freddie, maybe CMBS when you're in the apartment space. How are you financing these transactions? Regional, community banks? Is that typical or is there another source? Regional and community. I don't know that there's any kind of Fannie, Freddie product for these. Maybe, um, maybe some Wall Street money for a larger portfolio size. In fact, I'm sure there is because I, I am aware of a particular portfolio that sold last year, uh, north of 100 million. I, I think it was around 110 or 120 million. But um, for the individual parts, it's typically going to be relationships with uh, the local, regional, or community banks. Um, and even that can be a challenge because the RV space to a lot of lenders is new and mm -hmm. stand it. Uh, they're not going to loan on it. So if they they're not familiar with the asset type, um, they're not even going to look at it. And so finding that bank that's comfortable doing RV uh, parks is a little bit of a challenge. And uh, to finance the construction of Arcade Park, which um, when it's all said and done, will be in the 9 to $10 million range. Finding a lender to partner with us on that deal and get on board with the whole water park concept was a real challenge. RV resort, you, they're looking at risk, risk, riskier and riskiest. Uh, but after probably about two years of searching and going through about a hundred no's at least, getting turned down time and time and time again, finally we're able to uh, reach uh, an agreement and arrange the finances of construction of the park. And of course, once we have a proven model with this one, which we call, uh, the next round will be much easier. Proven or will be a proven product. Uh, so when we get ready to do our next project, which is in the pipeline, uh, it's a massive park, also in Texas area, but it will be billed as the largest RV resort in the state of Texas and possibly in the country. So just like we um, are proud of the having the largest hot tub, uh, well, we do have the largest RV resort in the pipeline. We have the property under uh, under contract and we're working with the local city uh, to go through the permitting and development process right now. And that will be a fairly massive undertaking, but it'll be a beautiful resort. Um, and I do have information on that if we, if 
any of our if any of your listeners are interested in receiving more information, um, we can talk about that later. But uh, you know, you got you got Jerry Jones over here with AT and T Stadium, the biggest football stadium probably in the country, and then you got Steve over here with the biggest RV car. So that's <laughs> everything's big in Texas, Jake. That's right. <laughs> there you uh, go. How bad? Uh, how bad are the insurance guys beating you up? Is it similar in per unit or less than multifamily? I'm guessing it's, it's gonna be less, right? It's less than multifamily. Yeah. So that's that's one of the beautiful things also about um, owning and operating an RV park. Just from a, a pure operational expense ratio perspective, the operation the operating expense is typically lower for RV parks, and therefore because it's lower, I can operate and run at a lower overall occupancy rate. Mm-hmm. I don't have to there's enough margin in the deal to where if my occupants dips to 70 percent i'm okay and i can still uh, service the debt take care of all my financial obligations unlike multifamily my experience has been closer to 85 percent and even 90 percent you have to keep those numbers uh, really strong um, to be able to service the debt in multifamily mm-hmm. so and the reason for that is very simple if you think about an apartment building you've got the vertical structure and bricks and rooftops and ACs and everything that's used to maintain my RV parks. All I have is a concrete slab, so I'm literally uh, leasing or renting out a concrete slab uh, with water, sewer, and electrical hookup, as opposed to something coming in a building that's got to be painted and new floors and new cabinets and appliances and on and on and on. And on. Uh, you don't have to deal with any of that, and um, it's a, a strong primary advantage uh, to operating in the RV space. You don't have that to deal with. Uh, Steve, any book recommendations, anything you've read in the last few years that you want to, you know, let the listeners know about? Or written. Besides mine. (laughs) So give give us a a plug for yours and how people can find out more about your project and then give us another book. Sure. Um, Well, so my first book, as you as mentioned earlier, was actually published in 2001 by John Wiley and Sons, and then the second edition came out in 2004. And that's the complete guide to buying and selling apartment buildings. It's been a popular, it continues to sell. Um, also published by John Wiley and Sons is the complete guide to real estate finance, and how to analyze any income producing as- asset. So some very uh, fundamental principles to understanding value. A lot of people um, don't really understand, is this apartment building worth a million or is it worth a million two or a million five? What's the right number? And they don't really understand valuation. Mm-hmm. That background has given me uh, the experience and insight. So those are out of the books that I've written. Those are my two favorite and they continue to be good sellers. Uh, and of course, you can find them on Amazon. So just go to Amazon, and plug in my name and the uh, book title. And there you go. Uh, for more information, our upcoming uh, park, RV Resort, is going to be billed as Summer Breeze, Texas. It's in the pipeline. We hope to break ground on that in 2020. But you can contact me. Um, my email address is steve at summerbreezeusa.com. So that's steve at summerbreezeusa.com. Shoot me an email and I'll send out a complete packet overview with the information and details about our projects. All right. You promised us another book that you read. Pardon me? No, I said, do you have a book recommendation for the folks as well? Besides, besides yours? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, not, not right off the top. I guess one of my old favorites is, um, is Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. But probably most of your listeners are familiar with that, but I've read that book. A number of times and there are just some key principles in there I keep going back to. It's been a while since I've read that, but um, nothing wrong with a classic. Yeah, I've read it myself multiple times. It's a good one. All right, Gino, anything else for Steve today? Um, just want to wrap it up real quick. I, I think the opportunity is RVs. I mean, wherever the opportunity lies, I think that's where you need to go. And I think that's what Steve is doing. Um, a couple of things that I noticed in the RV park that there's opportunity. Um, Steve is hunting for mom and pops. 
He's hunting for value. He's hunting for motivated sellers. And it seems like there's some barriers to entry in, in the space. So that might keep a lot of people out because people may, may get overwhelmed by all the difference of it. You have to really create a business where multifamily is a business, but people don't think of it as a business. Whereas RV parks, it looks like it has to be business because you might have stores there. You might have uh, other events going on. And I think the barrier to entry, the lending aspect of it, I think it's easier to finance a four unit than it is to finance an RV park. So I think a lot of people aren't going to go into it. So I think Steve has the opportunity to really capitalize on the space um and that's all i got jake it seems like an awesome area i think down the road it seems like maybe a little recession resistant also because as the as the demographics as people get older they're still going to go on vacation they can jump in it and it, it's it's a pretty cheap vacation people still need to go away and as the baby boomers start to age they're going to get into it more and we haven't even spoken about autonomous rvs because once autonomous rvs come on jake i ain't driving guess who's buying an rv maybe i'll buy an rv too and i'll go <laughs> visit one of steve's parks but for now I ain't driving one of those things, but uh, so you get. Do you get to Mars first with Elon Musk, or do you get the autonomous RV? Which one comes first? It's a good question, but I mean, it's gonna once autonomous comes out, it's gonna change everything. But could you imagine the space itself? I mean, everyone's gonna want one of those things. The thing is, they're they're awesome. Just don't want to drive them. I want to be driven, right? Hey, and, and maybe the uh, they'll just live in it permanently at the park and just do that. So we'll like that even more. <laughs> That'd be awesome. <laughs> Steve, just want to thank you for coming on and sharing your story and, you know, continued success. And everyone, check out Steve's books because, like I said, they were a lot of help to me in the beginning. He really broke everything down to me. Um, it made a lot of sense. It's all about the numbers. You'll learn how to analyze these deals and, you know, just continue to follow his journey in the RV space. Sounds good. Thank you, Steve. Take care, everybody. Okay, Jake. You know, appreciate it, guys. Thanks for having me as a guest today. Thank you.